Good morning. This place is full and there's a lot of people online watching and this is a place where we hear from God and we study the Bible, which is God's word. I was talking to someone this week and I told and I said, "Do you know how much you love God?" And he goes, he goes, "Well, how do I know how much I love God? How much you love the Bible and the word of God is how much you love God." If you love the word, you love God. And the more you love the word, the more you love God. How do you understand that? Like I I could spend hours. Yesterday I probably spent 8 hours just spending time just studying the Bible and I love it. And they would have gave me another 8 hours, I would have did it. I'm here probably with 2-3 hours sleep, but that because I spent so much time studying yesterday to get prepared for you guys today as well. But today we're going to be talking about the end times and we're going to continue that series and this is really important. We're going to find out today are we really in the end times and we're going to talk about four signs of the end times. I want you to get this that when we're studying the Bible, we're studying God's commands, his thoughts. He's the one that determines what's right and wrong and what is sin. We're living in a society that we now want to determine what's right and wrong and we want to set the laws in place. Just because it's legal here on earth doesn't mean it's legal in heaven. You got to be careful that that you're you're so into this world that you're not prepared for the next world. But this is what God does. He takes your I am to uh, and he makes it I, I was. You could say this I am a gangbanger. But when you have Jesus, I was a gangbanger. Or you could say, I am a liar. Well, some of that, liars don't usually admit they're liars. <laughs> but you could say, I was a liar. You could say, I am an adulterer. I, like, I'm a serial adulterer. Every chance I get, I go for it. And, but with Jesus, you could say, I was an adulterer. You could say, I am a pervert. No, it, usually perverts don't admit it. <laughs> but I was a pervert. I was a thief. I was, come on, I, whatever you were, God's taken it, it, it could take it and say, I was. Come on, there, there's no such thing as a Christian liar, Christian gangbanger, or Christian anything else God calls sin. Because he gives you the power not only to be forgiven, he gives you the power to overcome it and become a new person. Do you know that God could change your identity? That God could change your makeup? God can change your nature? Come on, let's give God praise. God can change your nature. God can change who you are and make you an I was, not an I'm not that no more. Now understand, without Jesus, you can't have an I was. If you're prostituting, if you're an addict, you're going to be an addict for the rest of your life and... That's just the way it's going to be. If you're depressed, you're going to be depressed of your life, rest of your life, and that's the way it's going to be. But I got good news for you. You could turn your I am into I was. I was depressed, but now I have the joy of the Lord and the peace. I used to be, I was, like I, I was an insomniac. I couldn't sleep. I was messed up. I was crazy. But now I have a sound mind because Jesus did a miracle in me. Let's give God praise that you can have a brand new beginning today. Now, as a pastor, I don't skip scriptures. I don't edit the Bible to fit today's times because God's word doesn't change. God, God's word doesn't change with the time. So don't be a progressive Christian that all of a sudden starts editing scripture to match your lifestyle instead of you adjusting your lifestyle to scripture. That's not us. We believe that the word of God is perfect. It has zero mistakes. And what he calls wrong is wrong. We calls right is right. We're here to learn what's right so we can start getting the right results. Come on. Is there anybody ready to adjust your life and change today? I heard a, a speaker yesterday that was in this room. They had a big conference, a business conference, and they probably had over 2,000 people in this room. And some of the people paid $2,000 a seat to come here to learn some business principles yesterday. Um, we're, we're here 
to learn the greatest principles. Whatever leadership principles they were teaching, what we're teaching you is way higher than that. This will bless every part of your life. Come on, you guys ready to go to the next level? Now, before I get into the word, I want to let you know where you're at. Um, your commitments away from growth. Sam, I'm commitments away from growth. You're also repentance away from growth. That means change the way you're thinking so you can have a new life. Commitment that you have an opportunity is today's membership class. If, if you've never made an official, you said, this is my church home. Make it official. I would love to shake your hand. I want to know who I'm pastoring. So we're going to have an opportunity at 1 o'clock this afternoon and right after this class. If you're saying, I've never officially made this my church home, make it your church home. You'll even get a church ID. It's going to be amazing. It's going to make you official. Are you a member? Where's your ID? I don't have one. Come on, get your ID. Right? Don't put it off. And remember, commitment. Some of us are scared of commitment because we've been hurt from the commitments we've made. Don't be scared. You're in a safe place. And this is what happens. When you're planted and committed to the house of God, God promises you this. You'll flourish in everything you do. Those who are planted in the house of God will flourish in everything they do. And I really believe this. You, I believe that you should not be homeless in, in really in the physical world, but you shouldn't be homeless in the spiritual world either. You should know, have a church home and you should know who your pastor is and you should know who your family is. Come on, everybody needs a home. Make this your home. We love you. And I, I want to see you there if you've not made this church your home yet. I'm going to pray and we're going to get into some serious business today because we're going to talk about the signs of the times and understand what the Bible says about it. And we're going to be talking about hot topics today. Um, and we need to talk about these topics because if we don't talk about it, nowhere else are, are you going to be able to get this information. This is really important. So let's pray, get ready to receive. And understand, if something, if, if something you feel like, man, I'm getting offended by this, don't get offended. Repent of it. And just say, God, I'm sorry, forgive me, and you can have a new life, okay? You understand this? Don't hold on to your life. Let it go, and God will give you a new life, okay? Father, we just thank you that your Holy Spirit's here. That means you're the one teaching us. I'm asking you, Lord, to help me with this teaching. We're talking about the last days. We're talking about prophecy. We're talking about the future. We're talking about the present. And I just thank you, Lord, by the time we're done, that every one of us will be saved, be born again, become brand new, and experience the abundant life that you want to give us and the eternal life you want to give us. Today's the time to get prepared. Today's the day of salvation. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. We have this moment. Help us to be in the moment and be at the edge of our seats, ready to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Four signs of the end times. The end times refers to a period of time that precedes the rapture, the tribulation, the second coming, and the final judgment of all people. It's a time before that happens. So what's next? The answer is the rapture of the church. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, it says this, for the Lord himself, Jesus himself, will come down from heaven with a command and shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. First, the believers that have died will rise from their graves. Then, together with them, the believers who have died, we who are still alive and remain on the earth will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then, we will be with the Lord forever. Then, we will be with the Lord forever. This scripture is saying something maybe you've never heard because every one of us know that you live and then you die. But when Jesus comes back, it's going to be the rapture. That means that some people that are alive during the rapture will not die. They're going to be transformed in a moment and they're going to take, give, give up their mortal and take on the immortal. And if Jesus were to come back right now, believers that are here in this room will get, go right through the ceiling and be with the Lord forever. There's going to be a mass disappearance. The rapture will be the beginning of the judgment of God on sin. The first part of this judgment 
is an initial separation of believers from non-believers. Or another way to say it, it's followers of Jesus Christ and unrepented sinners. There's only two groups, saved and unsaved, believers and non-believers. If you think you're a believer or you're, or you're not sure you're a believer, you're not a believer quite yet. A believer knows they're a believer. They've made a decision to follow Jesus. So today in this group, if, if the rapture were to happen today, this is what would happen. Some people would go with the Lord and some people would stay. Now, if you stayed, you're going to stay for the great tribulation. We're not going to get into that, but it's going to be the worst time in the history of the world. But you'll be left behind. I want to show you a video, which is a skit that a church did, but it kind of shows the story or it shows the picture of the rapture on a Sunday morning just like this. Some will be taken, others will be left. And this is a question. Will you be taken? Will you be left? Will you be ready for the rapture? Take a look at this video. I want you to know, church, that Jesus Christ could come this month, or he might come next week, or he could even come... Some of you guys got the heebie-jeebies scared out of you. Boom. Now, this is not something that we hope is going to happen. It's going to happen. We don't know when it's going to happen, but that's what we're waiting for. And the purpose of this teaching is to make sure that we're not just prepared for this life, but we're prepared for the eternal life. Why has God given us signs? We're going to talk about signs of the end times. Is this day, this rapture, going to happen soon? The answer that God's given us signs is so that we will know that the end is near. In Luke 17, 37, it says, Where will this happen, Lord? The disciples asked Jesus. And Jesus replied, Just as the gathering of vultures shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. We're going to talk about some signs but these signs will indicate that the end is near. This sign will indicate that Jesus is coming back soon. We're going to talk about those signs. If the signs are not here in our time, no worries. We don't have to prepare. He's not coming soon. But if we are and we do see the signs and we're just going to cover four today, then we really need to be concerned and make sure that we're ready and stay ready. The generation that sees these signs will know that Jesus is right at the door, that his return is very near. God has given us the ability to prophesy or forecast or be prophecy forecasters. These signs will take place before Jesus raptures his church. If we don't see the signs, we're okay, but if we, do, if we don't, we got to get ready. In Matthew 24, 32, it says, Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When, it branches, when, when its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know his return is very near, right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation that sees these signs will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. In my house, I have a tree that's an apricot tree, and it's in, it's in my front yard. During the winter, it has no leaves. You would think the tree is dead. But just last month, the most beautiful, burgundy flowers 
appeared. And the whole tree looked like a big, huge flower. And it was just letting me know the seasons are changing. Springtime is here and apricots are coming. We could know about a tree where God is saying, just like you would know about a tree and a tree is blooming because seasons are changing, you would know by the signs that I'm giving you that the seasons have shifted and you've entered the last days and get ready for my coming. You don't know the day, but I am coming. So what are the four signs of the end times? I'm going to give you four of them. Great Sign number one, a great rejection of God. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 1, through four it says, now we do implore you by the very certainty of Christ's coming. Jesus Christ came once. It's certain he is coming again. It's been 2,023 years since he came the first time. And since that moment, he promised, I'm coming back. And are meeting him together. This is for believers. Don't let anyone deceive you by any means whatsoever. That day will not come before there arises a definite rejection of God. He's only going to come after there's been a definite rejection of God. We must ask ourselves, has there been a definite rejection of God even in our country recently? The word rejection of God means apostasy. It means a fallen away, a defection, a forsaken, a total desertion, a departure from the principles, the commands and word of God. Has there been a departure from the commands, the study of the word of God? Well, there has. The end time rejection of God started in the 1960s, banning prayer and the Bible out of our public schools. We were a nation that was completely under God and the schools, the history of the schools in our country were started in churches. Schools were churches and churches were schools. What was taught in the schools was mathematics. They, they taught farming. They taught English. They taught writing skills. But they also taught about God because it was part of the foundation of our country. But in, the but in 1962, in the case of Engel versus Vitali, the Supreme Court officially banned prayer in public schools. The court ruled that it was unconstitutional for public schools to require students to recite non-denominational prayers. In 1963, another, another case, the court extended the ruling to include the banning of Bible readings in public schools. Since these Supreme Court rulings, school-sponsored prayer and religious practices have been prohibited in public schools in the United States. Just think about it. Communicating with God and teaching the Word of God in our schools became illegal. And the teaching of the theory of evolution and moral immorality became legal. Every time there's a vacuum, Satan fills it. It's not just there's a vacuum. Take God out. When you take God out, ungodliness fills the spot. We're in the end times. We must remember that the foundation of our country was based on strong faith in God. On every dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. I'm wondering when they're going to edit the dollar bill. But, but the next form of money is going to be digital money. God will have nothing to do with that because it's going to be setting up a worldwide government which actually will be an antichrist set up so we could have worldwide economy so there could be a worldwide leader which would be the antichrist. But in God we trust. Every dollar bill. Remember back in the day I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God. We used to put our hands on our chest and look at the flag and commit ourselves to the republic 
for which it stands. And we would say that we are, this is our identity. We are a nation under God. It's almost like that is now illegal. It's not politically correct. We've actually taken on the mindset of our society and some of us would be, feel really uncomfortable about saying the Pledge of Allegiance and saying one nation under God. There was a song that we used to sing, God bless America. Land that I love. Stand beside her, guide her through the night with the light from above. God bless America, my home sweet home. Let me give you some quotes of our founding fathers. George Washington, he said this, it is impossible to rightly govern a nation without God and the Bible. Benjamin Franklin said this, here is my creed. I believe in one God, the creator of the universe, that he governs it by his providence that he ought to be worshiped. James Madison, religion is the basis of foundation of government. And a recent president, Ronald Reagan, forewarned, if we ever forget that we are one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. The rejection of God leads to a society that tolerates and accepts everything but the preaching of Jesus and the Bible. As the moment we took God out of the picture, we don't want him to be part of our society. We don't want him to be part of our lives. We don't want him to be part of our teachings. We don't want him in our schools. This is what happened. We became a society that doesn't tolerate it anymore. In 2 Timothy 4, 3, it says this, for the time will come when people will not tolerate sound doctrine, understand this. This is a recent thing. We used to be a Christian nation. We no longer identify ourselves as a Christian nation. We are now a post-Christian nation. For the time will come when people will not tolerate what? Sound doctrine, accurate instructions, that challenges them with God's truth. But wanting to have their ears tickled with something pleasing. They will accumulate for themselves many teachers, one after another, chosen to satisfy their own desires and to support the errors they hold. This is crazy. That whatever lifestyle that you want to have, you might be able to find a leader that will twist the scriptures to match up with your lifestyle. God has not given us scripture to edit. He's given, given us scripture to lead us. See, we want to be happy. We want to be successful. We want, we want healthy families. We want to be, we want to, we want to, we want to go to heaven. We want to overcome. We want to be victorious. But this is what we want to do. We want to break all the rules and do it our way. And I'm telling you, if you do it your way, all those things that you want, you'll never have. Rejection of God. Everything's tolerated but God. This year, January 9th, 2023, there's an anti-missionary bill proposed in Israel. Think about Israel. The land where Jesus was born. The land Jesus came from. This is the language of the bill. It's focused on Christian missionary groups. The bill would make soliciting an adult to convert to Christianity punishable by one year in jail. The penalty would increase two years if the individual being solicited was a minor. We're headed towards great, the greatest persecution we've ever had because we're headed towards the Antichrist world. A, the great rejection of God. I'm going to show you a video on how even the news edits Jesus out of the stories. I'm going to show you where we're at. Everything 
is left there, cuss words are left there. But as long as you don't give glory to Jesus Christ, because we reject that. Take a look at this video. This is the real footage, but this is the tampered footage. Andre, congratulations. How do you turn this around? Man, first off, I need uh, the first thing my Lord will say to you is man, listen. The issue with sin, it, 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 it makes us, our sin that's in us makes us do those things. And the only, the only salvation for this sin is the gospel. The only way to really cure that was on the inside is understanding that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And so the, to me, on a micro level, it's understanding. So it, just like that, we lost him. I know. I Masters champion, Bubba Watson. <laughs> Um, and then second, I got to thank uh, my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> this day means so much more than, than putting on this green jacket in many ways. All right, so a uh, technical glitch there from Augusta National, but we will bring you much more of uh, Bubba Watson, obviously. They are... All of a sudden, they have glitches. As soon as you mention Jesus. We're living in a canceled culture, and what's being canceled is Jesus and the Word of God. Sign number two, it will be like the days of Noah in Matthew 24, 37. When the Son of Man returns, when Jesus returns, it will be like it was in Noah's day. It will be like the days of Noah in that they were completely unaware that the judgment was coming. In Matthew 24, 38, it says this, in those days before the flood, and we know this, that the earth was completely covered by water, the people were enjoying banquets, parties, weddings, right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. This is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. We'll just be busy. Business as usual, not thinking about it, and being left behind and missed it. Soon as it began to rain, because God warned the people for 120 years as Noah was building an ark in the middle of nowhere, letting them know judgment is coming, rain is coming, a flood is coming, there's room in the boat for you. They continued partying, they continued their lifestyle, they began to ignore the preacher, they tried to edit him, I'm sure, look at that crazy guy, they began to mock him until it rained. And when the rain started, and the flood started to rise, people realized Noah was warning us. He told us the truth. But this is what happened. The door was shut. And God shut the door. And there was no way to open it. There's going to be a day that the door is shut. And there's nothing you can do to open it. The last thing you want to do is gain everything this world has to offer. And at the end, you end up separated from God forever and ever and ever. Not only are you depressed now, not only are you addicted now, not only are you confused now, not only is everything falling apart now, but you're going to get to a place if you don't receive Jesus where you'll be lost forever. The Bible talks about hell being such a bad place to be that it'd be better for you to cut off your arm if it caught, or your hand if it caused you to sin than to end up in hell with two hands. It's better to end up in heaven with one hand or one eye and make it to heaven. God is saying, this is serious business. Your soul is at stake. What also happened in those days of Noah? Why did God judge the earth with, and flood the earth with rain? It will be like the days of Noah in that the world will be filled with violence. Increase in violence. There will be an increase in the last days of violence because there will be no value for life. The end times will become more and more dangerous. As soon as we take God out of the equation, we're nothing more than animals. A few years back, as Pastor Robert's daughter was at one of the local high schools, one of the biology teachers had all the students say this, we 
are animals. Say it with me. We, don't, you guys don't say it. We are animals. You are not an animal. You are created in God's image. You're supposed to be a child of God. You have a soul. Come on. You have a mind. You know right from wrong. Come on. Give God some praise. God has a plan for your life. But what was happening in Noah's time? In Genesis 6, 11, it shows us. Now God saw that the earth had become corrupt and was filled with violence. I'm just going to cover one area of violence. Of course, there's wars now. And there's threats of wars and rumors of wars. And right now, there's some big wars that are on the horizon. Of course, in Israel, they always have war. But we're allies to Israel. And it looks like the whole world is against, against Israel. If Israel gets in a bigger war, guess who's going to get involved in that war? United States of America. Our kids will be recruited and we'll be entering a world war. But we're even closer than that in, to a world war in Taiwan today. There's a big fight over Taiwan. China claims Taiwan as their territory. They're flying their planes over Taiwan. They're threatened in war in the next few years. Russia and, 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 China, and China are right now gathering together, even fighting against Ukraine. Understand, if China invades Taiwan, the United States of America is going to war, which could be World War III. This is what's on the horizon. But I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about just the mass shootings. There have been more mass shootings this year in 2023 than days. Every day, there's at least one mass shooting, if not more. As of April 17th, there have been 163 mass shootings this year. A mass shooting is defined as an incident in which four or more victims are shot or killed. But just 20 years ago, in 2001, there was four killed and four wounded in mass shootings. Basically, it was non-existent. This is a new thing. But in the last days, there'll be an increase in violence. Just 20 years later, in 2021, 2001, four people killed. In 2021, 693 mass shootings, almost two a day. 303 killed, 2,842 wounded. What's going on? We take God out of our schools. We take God out of our country. There's no value for life. And I'm not even talking about abortion, which is killing millions of unborn children. We're becoming a violent society. The Bible says in the last days, it will be dangerous times. Because the more we live for pleasure, the more we'll sacrifice people for our pleasure. A hedonistic society lives for pleasure, and a hedonistic society is violent. They don't care who they hurt, who they abuse, as long as I get to my pleasure. You don't have to go real far to look into archives to find out that we're in the last days. This is what I did. I went all the way back to yesterday. This is news. Let me show you yesterday's news and just show you the war, the mass shootings. This is yesterday's news. Take a look at it. Tonight, the mass shooting in Texas and the all-out manhunt for the alleged killer. The FBI cornering the suspect in the woods late today. He allegedly gunned down five of his neighbors execution style with an AR-15 after they complained about the noise he was making. This father lost his wife and eight-year-old son. This was a uh, bloody, gruesome crime. Uh, all of them were headshot in an execution style. Dangerous escape. The U.S. finally evacuating American civilians from war-torn Sudan. New details on their treacherous journey guarded by military drones overhead. Coast-to-coast -coast flooding and the weekend washout for the Northeast that's not letting up. We're tracking the storms. 
A fiery drone attack inside Russian-held territory. Was Ukraine behind it? The giant mass of... They mentioned something, increase in natural disasters. That's going to happen too, which is not one of the signs I'm going to cover today. But that was yesterday's news. The question is, are we seeing the signs? Are we becoming more violent? Is, is this world becoming more unsafe? There was never a thought when I go to a movie theater, I'm looking for the exit. But when I go to a movie theater right now, I go, if, if something happens, I already know where I'm going. Our kids are going to school and they have drills. Police departments are preparing for mass shootings. Here in San Bernardino, we had a mass shooting where 23 people were killed here in San Bernardino. And our church went out there, we prayed with the families, we were on the news, but understand this, it's hit our city. We're in the last days. Violence will only get, it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse because this is the beginning of the end times. All we're doing, are we in the end times? Are these the signs? It's happening. Sign number three. And understand this. When we cover this subject, when God calls something a sin, he's not trying to judge you. He's trying to save you. But if we don't talk about these subjects, here in the church, we don't care. I, we're not going to edit stuff, not talk about stuff in church, because if we don't talk about here and there's a certain part of our society that becomes taboo and we can't mention it, what we're saying, go to hell. We don't, we'd rather not offend you and you go to hell and we'd rather just keep it all safe. We're not here to try to keep you safe here. We're trying to keep you safe for eternity. I love you. And no matter what lifestyle that you're in, you can be born again and saved. Sign number three, it will be like the days of Lot. In Luke 17, 28, it says this, and the world will be as it was in the days of Lot. So it'll be like the days of Noah, violence. It will be like the days of Lot in that the people were unaware that judgment was coming. Understand, consequences are always at the end of your sin rainbow. Just because you feel you're getting away with it doesn't mean that this week it's not all going to catch up with you. And the price you're going to pay is higher than you ever thought. Unaware. Luke 17, 28, people went about their daily business in Sodom and Gomorrah, eating and drinking and buying and selling and farming and building until the morning Lot left Sodom, Lot was saved because he heard a message from an angel that judgment was coming to Sodom and he has an opportunity to go and not turn back. He did. Then fire and burning sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. Verse 30, yes, it will be business as usual right up to the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, it's going to be like the days of Lot and the days of Sodom and Gomorrah in this as well. Why were they judged with fire? There will be an increase in sexual immorality and perversion. It will be a society where immorality and homosexuality will not only be accepted, it will be promoted. We have to be super careful when we're talking about these subjects because we're exposed so much to Society, We're exposed so much to our social media that before you know it, we start thinking like the world instead of thinking like God. And understand, if you have a daughter or a son that's suffering from homosexuality, I mean, that's, that's struggling with homosexuality, maybe you are here too. No one, you do not love your son or daughter if you don't tell them the truth. Well, they might get offended at me. You're never going to be mean. You're never going to be judgmental. You're going to love them and let them know there's one thing, there's nothing you can do, baby, for me to stop loving you. I'm going to love you 
every single day of your life. If you never change, I love you. But I love you enough to tell you the truth so you can repent and be saved. I just don't want you here on this earth. I want you with me forever. I know it's a fight. But I'm fighting for your souls today. I love you. It will be like the days of Sodom. In Jude 7, look what it says. What happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? Let's see what happened. And the cities near them is an example for us of the punishment of eternal fire. The people of these cities suffered the same fate that God's people and the angels did. Because, it's because, is why they suffered. Because they committed sexual sins, a rise in sexual morality, and engaged in homosexual activities. Current stat, stats on LGBTQ. 3.5% of adults in the U.S. identify as LGBTQ. One point, I mean, 0 0.3, less than a percent, identify as transgender. More than half, 57% of the LGBTQ community identifies as bisexual. So the majority of the LGBTQ community actually goes both ways. We're living in a society that pleasure is the God. How does, how does someone become a homosexual? How, is, how does that even happen? Well, some of it happens through, through sexual abuse. They're introduced by a predator. And they were exposed, to, and their first experience was a homosexual experience. Some of it happens through exposure. You can't continue watching the porn and get in exposing yourself to the ideas without becoming inquisitive. The idea is whatever you watch, you build desire for. So that's part of it. The other part is this. You were born with homosexual tendencies. And maybe you've never heard that because some Christians say, no, you can't be born that way. Understand, you're born with a lean to, sort, to some sort of sin. But I got good news for you. You could be born as a liar. You could be born as violent. You could be born with a tendency to be very angry. You could be born as, come on, just a perversion. Whatever it is that you're born as, I got good news for you. You can be born again and you can become a new person. We're not telling you to cope. We're not telling you to try to white knuckle it. We're talking about a God that can set you free of your old identity and give you a new nature. How many believe that Jesus is in the saving business and he's in the life transforming business? I know it's a tough subject, but understand this. If we don't talk about it, who's going to love you enough to say, hey, this is what the Bible says. And all it's saying is this will be one of the signs of the last days. The LGBTQ community in, in Gen Z and millennials is the highest. It's a 17, 7.2%. So it's almost double the national average. Gen Z though is one in five, which is 20% identifies LGBTQ. If this trend continues, the next generation will be at 40 to 50%. How is that happening? Exposure. And, and the, the, the idea is exposure without Bible exposure. And you know what's crazy? As churches are scared to talk about it, and I'm telling any pastor that doesn't talk about this, I'm going to tell you this, he doesn't care about people. He just cares about building a, a church. He's a politician. He's not a representative of heaven. If someone loves you, they're going to share the whole Bible. And I'm asking you, don't step out. Just listen. Gen Z adults who identify as LGBTQ have increased from 10.5% in 2017 to 20.8% in 2021. That's double in four years. This shows you it's not that just you're born that way. This is what's happening. There's many, being, many people being converted into the lifestyle. And the reason we're converted into the lifestyle is because there's something missing in our lives. And then we start thinking, well, maybe that's what's missing. 
And the transgender community is even growing even more because I feel like I'm, I'm out, like I don't feel comfortable in my body. I'm going to tell you this, probably no one feels totally comfortable in their body. But understand this, convert, cutting pieces off your body, taking different hormones, or changing the way you dress is not going to fix the inside of you. And that's what's happening is that we're, the reason the world is giving them that option because they don't know you could be born again. They don't know you could be saved. They don't know there's joy. They don't know there's peace. They don't know there's eternal life. They don't know that Jesus resurrected from the dead to give eternal life. Come on, give God some praise that no matter what sin that you're involved with, if you're a drug addict, you can be set free today. That's through your power, not your willpower, but his power. Come on, are you with? Come on. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to show you a video. And this video is kind of just showing what's replaced the teaching of the Bible and the teaching, I mean, of prayer. Now we're teaching alternative lifestyles to our children. The next generation, Satan already knows, if I get the children, I get the whole generation. Satan is planting seeds, and we got to plant seeds of truth. If, we don't, if you don't hear this here, you're setting up your teenagers, your young adults are going to university. If they don't know an absolute truth here, they're going to follow and gobble up every lie out there because they've never heard the truth. They didn't know they had that, that homosexuality, you've never heard it, is a sin. Adultery is a sin. Lying is a sin. Being a thief is a sin. Being a drunkard is a sin. Come on, be, all those things are sins. And if you don't repent of your sins, you cannot be saved. Understand this. You can't be a practicing sinner and be saved. Now understand, God's not telling you to white knuckle it. He's telling you, I'll save you and I'll give you a greater desire than you've ever had to please me. I'll transform you and I'll give you my nature. Let's take a look at this video. This is what's happening right now. There's actually a lot of teaching on this subject. And it's transforming the minds of our children. And they're getting more confused than ever. Take a look at this. A family can be made up in many different ways. It's Rather called Soji for sexual orientation and gender identification. And a curriculum that teaches public school students across Canada to, to celebrate the homosexual lifestyle and that gender is fluid. Is no. In other words, no. your gender is not dependent on what parts you were born with, but rather what you feel like in the moment. There's people that are boys, there's people that are girls. There are, peop there are people whose gender might be a little bit of both or might even be neither. Lessons include books about transgender children, such as 10,000 Dresses and songs like The Rainbow Song. Gender won't decide the choices we make. Some boys like dressing up, some girls like catching snakes. The Soji curriculum started in British Columbia in 2016 and is quickly spreading throughout Canada. Okay, so during third period, we have announcements and they do the Pledge of Allegiance. I always tell my class, Stand if you feel like it. Don't stand if you feel like it. Say the words if you want. Don't have to say the words. So my class decided to stand but not say the words. Totally fine. Except for the fact that my room does not have a flag. It used to be there. But I took it down during COVID because it made me uncomfortable. And um, I packed it away and I don't know where. And I haven't found it yet. <laughs> But my kid today goes, hey, um, it's kind of weird that we just stand and then, you know, we say it to nothing. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, I got to find it. Like, I'm working on it. I got you. <laughs> in the meantime, I tell this kid, we do have a flag in the class that you can pledge your allegiance to. And he, like, looks around. And he goes, oh, that one? Understand, these would be the signs of the last days. It would be an increase. We've never seen an increase like we have right now. This is a sign of the last days. It's, it's, it's in Scripture. And remember, this was written before it happened. So there's no other culture or time or season in the history of the world that this is so relevant. 
The only hope for any sinner is Jesus. And he loves you. And he wants to have a relationship with you. And whatever you're missing is not another guy, another girl, another sexual affair, another drug. It's Jesus Christ. He's the only one who can make you whole and give you peace. But you got to surrender. And sign number four, and we'll end it with this. The gospel of Jesus Christ preached through all the world. In Matthew 24, 14, it says, And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations, every person will hear it, and then the end will come. Just think about this. There's never been a generation that every single person on the earth could hear about Jesus because we did not have the technology. In 2021, there was 15 billion phones active. There's only 7.8 billion people alive. You know what that means? Two phones per person. So right now we have the technology for the first time in the history of the world for every single person on earth to hear about Jesus. Jesus said this before the technology. It was impossible then, but it's possible here. All I'm asking you is take an honest look. Do we see these signs? These were prophecies before, and they were given, but now we're seeing these prophecies fulfilled. And he says, these signs must take place before I return. But there's a question. Are the signs here? And if they're here, don't be like the people of Noah's day that ignore the preacher and die. Or don't be like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah that die. Because God's not giving you this message to punish you. He's giving this message to save you, to make you whole, to make you complete. You were created to have a relationship with Jesus. And I don't care whatever lifestyle that you choose, it's going to leave you empty and in despair. Understand, you're headed on a road to not nowhere. You're headed on a road to destruction. So why hasn't the rapture happened yet? And the answer is, God is waiting for us to repent and be saved. The signs are here. So what's causing him to wait? He loves you so much. He says, you're not ready. I got to wait a little more. I got to wait a little more. He loves you. And 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord isn't really being slow about his promised return. As some people think, no, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone, wants everyone, wants everyone to repent and be saved and spend eternity with him. Come on, give God some praise. He's patient with us and he's waiting. It's a commitment. And no matter what lifestyle you're in, and there's somebody here struggling with an addiction and you tried to overcome, you couldn't. To tell, to tell a drug addict that's been a drug addict, since he's been a teenager, hey, just stop. It's easy for you to say. And so you have to go through the withdrawals and the pain. And all you know is that. But I got good news for you. If you call on Jesus, he'll save you. He'll set you free. Come on, without withdrawals. It can happen today. It's easy for you to say, hey, break up with your adulterous affair when you don't understand that, I, I don't got nothing else to go to. I've ruined my family. This is all I got. I gave up my family for her or him. Are you telling me to give up him too? See, when you put yourself in somebody else's shoes, you start thinking, well, will they, they have to give that up too? Yeah. It's the same thing with any lifestyle. You got to be willing to lose it to gain the real one. All God is saying, trade in your misery, trade in your addiction, trade in your pain, trade in your way for my way. And I guarantee you, my way is way better than yours. And my way will lead you to eternal life. Come on, it's a decision. Stop self-medicating yourself thinking you got the answer. Your identity is not your sin. Your identity needs to be that you become a son and daughter of the Lord. Today's your day. So if you're in this room, just be honest. If Jesus were to come back just like that skit, would you stay or would you go? And if you're saying, Pastor, I don't know. Well, be honest, I don't know. Well, you don't have to leave here not knowing because you can make a decision to give your life to Jesus and be forgiven, saved, and receive a new life. 
When Jesus saves you, you don't join a religion. When Jesus saves you, enter into a relationship. It's kind of like being a light with a lot of potential, but you're not plugged in. You're going to get plugged into the power and be everything that God called you to be. Today's your day. Being born again is a total experience. Every single person that goes to heaven has two birth dates. You have your physical birth date, and then you have your spiritual birth date. Do you know your physical birth date? I do mine. April 21st just happened last week. All right? But you. But do you have a day that you were born again that you gave your life to Jesus? Today's April 30th. Could be your day that you gave your life to Jesus where you know I gave my life to Jesus. I repented of my sins and I receive eternal life and I was forgiven. If Jesus Christ came, I'd go with them because I made him my Lord and Savior. It's a decision. You come to where you are. Or maybe you're saying, Pastor, I gave my life to the Lord, but I walked away. I have not been alert. I've been living a careless life, just drinking, partying, living my own way, and not aware of a let sin creep back into my life. It's starting to take over. The miseries come back in. I'm worse than I ever have been. Come back home. This scripture, not the, this scripture, none of this teaching is to, is to judge you. This, this, all this teaching is to make you whole and complete. Come on, give your life. Come back home. You walked away, come back home. His arms are wide open, love you and care for you. We love you. Or maybe you're just in this room saying, man, I'm struggling with this sin. And would you talk to me about it? I realize the way I'm living is wrong. I know. I've talked to myself into thinking it's not, but I know it is. And I'm ready to give it up. But I need God to help me because I can't do it on my own. And God says, I totally understand. I love you and I'll help you. And I'll accept you and I'll hold you and I'll transform you. Okay? When I count to three, if you're saying you're part of any one of those three groups, I don't, I don't know if I'm right with God, but I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to be saved. Or I've walked away. It's time for me to come back home. Or man, I'm struggling with something that I need to turn away from today. Admit it's a sin and ask God to save me from it. One, when I say three, raise your hands, all those bills. Don't be ashamed. God's not ashamed of you. Make this your public declaration. Jesus didn't die in some shadow. He died publicly in front of everybody, really naked, in front of everybody, paying the price for all of our sins. We did the crime. He did the time. He loves you so much. What he's saying is the price has already been paid. Will you let me forgive you? Will you let me set you free? Will you let me save you? I want you to be with me now and forever. Two. And when I say three, raise your hands. I want to be saved. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. Or I really, I'm ready to give up this life. So I'm done with it. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this building. I see the hand. Proud of you, baby. Proud of you. Come on, anybody else? Raise your hands. Raise your hands. Keep them up high. Come on, keep them up high. No one's going to get saved without, come on. Don't be ashamed of God. God bless you, baby. God's not, gonna, God's not ashamed of you. Come on, proud of you. Proud of you. Come on, it takes a real man and woman to say that I'm serving God. I want those that raise their hands. Could you stand up right where you're at? Those that raise their hands. Stand up right where you're at. Just stand up right where you're at. Raise your hand. Come on, let's give them a hand. Come on, it takes a real bold decision to follow Jesus. Come on, it's no joke. Everybody else stand up with them. Those that raise their hands. You want to recommit your life to the Lord. You want to give your life to Jesus. You want to be saved. You want to be ready for Jesus' second coming. I, those that raise their hands, I want you to leave your seat and come up here real quick. I want to pray with you. This is your first step of leaving. Come on, leave your addiction. Leave your depression. Leave your failure. Leave your past. Leave your past lifestyle. Come on. As they're coming forward, let's give them a hand. Come on. Someone's daughter, someone's son. Your son's next. Your daughter's next. If you can celebrate this one. Your mama's next. Your brother's next. If you can celebrate this one. Come on, church. Let's celebrate. Someone's giving their life to Jesus. This is bigger than a graduation in a high school, a graduation in a university. Someone's being transformed for eternity. We love you. Come on. Come on. Let them know we love them. Come on. Let them know we love them. They should be big. Online, if you're there, just stand up where you're at. We're going to pray right now. You're going to give your life to Jesus. Jesus is ready to set you free. All right. Ask your neighbor, you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. I want to make sure we don't miss anybody. There's someone out here. This is your moment. You don't, tomorrow's not guaranteed. There's someone here. Yeah, you're in this room. Your next lap around 
It's gonna be the it's gonna be the pay lap. It's gonna be horrible. And God's trying to save you from that pay lap. God says, I'll forgive you, I'll set you free. Somewhere right now, it looks like you've been dodging bullets, and God is saying it's time for you to get saved. I did not bring you in this place to be entertained, but I brought you in this place to transform your life. Come on, leave your seat, come up here. You might, some of you might not have another chance. Your next page, your next chapter will be prison, it could be death, it could be great suffering. This is your moment. Church, we're fighting for souls. We're not playing games. Understand? Come on, church. Come on. Aren't you glad that you're part of a church that's not, we're not playing? We love, we love people. We love God. We love you. There's not any subjects in the Bible that we're going to dodge, but we're going to tell you the truth in a lot of love. There was a young man in our church, he helps us with media right now in the service. And he was dealing with homosexuality for years. And he come to the church and he come up for, I got, I'm depressed, I'm struggling. And he's I, I, praying for all kinds of stuff. And then when we brought up this subject, this is what he said. He gave his life to Jesus, surrendered that. He goes, I realized I was hiding this lifestyle. But this is what he told me. He goes, the reason I never repented of homosexuality because it wasn't mentioned in church and because it, it wasn't mentioned in church I thought the subject was taboo so I couldn't even talk about it either that's not gonna happen here we're gonna start a ministry understand here it's gonna be a big ministry reaching the hurting and broken from come on from the LGBTQ community come on they're hurting they're hurting come on they're depressed they're struggling we're gonna reach out to them with the love of Jesus and give them hope Come on, Jesus is the answer. We love him. We're going to reach out. It's going to be a place where they can feel home and be saved. Right? All of us have sinned. Ain't nobody better than nobody. And understand, don't make one sin bigger than the other. Stop. Don't do that. Well, I'm not so bad as someone. Stop that. That's, that's crazy. Your sin is just as bad as anybody else's sin. Your sin disqualifies you from heaven like anybody else's. There's not a, one sin greater than another. It's sin. That's it. And no matter what you do, done, you can be forgiven. Praise God. Right? Okay, we're going to pray. Church, membership afterwards. If this is your home church, you have made official, I want to see you over there. I want to shake your hand, all right? Let's pray, okay? Pray. This is a house of prayer. Maybe you never prayed in school. I'm sure most of you prayed in school during a test. <laughs> Lord Jesus, help me understand this stuff. All right, let's pray. Repeat after me. Say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I've done it my way. And I also understand that the price for sin, the punishment for sin is death and suffering. But I believe that you love me so much that you suffered and you died for my sins. Paid the price for all the wrong I've done so that I could be forgiven and set free. Today, I open my heart and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Set me free from all addiction, the power of sin. Set me free from demons, cycles of destruction, past pain, abuse, and make me new today. I accept you and confess you as my Lord and Savior today. From this day forward, I turn away from my sin life to follow you for the rest of my life. I am now a child of God. I am saved. I am born again, and I am filled with your Holy Spirit. I'm a new person today. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and giving me the gift of eternal life. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Everyone that's up here want to pray with you and help you on your next step. Congratulations. Welcome to the family. But we want to make sure we pray with you and help you your next step. Your next step is baptism. We have a class starting at the way. And membership is going to start uh, in, I guess, 15 minutes or so. And we'll have some little food over there for you if you're hungry. 
God bless you. We love you. If you need prayer, come on up this way. We'd love to pray with you. Remember, church, if God's for you, there's no one can come against you. 